Then I got to go to Kia ora, I'm uh, Kosa Mountain Toko Ingwa. I'm the director of Wa Korero, which is the public program of uh, Fenua Ukai Poor Connectedness. Uh, on day two of this five day uh, exhibition uh, to acknowledge the United Nations at 75 years and to bring Māori, Indigenous, and many cultures' voices uh, to the notion of sustainability, uh, with a particular focus on the 17 United Nations Sustainability Development Goals. Uh, this particular session today is one of a number which involves uh, artists and practitioners that uh, have produced work for the exhibition and some special guests um, from science and academia uh, who have, as part of their practice, uh, some focus on sustainability. So our discussions will include hearing from each of these practitioners some aspect of, of, of their work. Unfortunately, we haven't got time to hear about all of it <laughs> because... It's deep and long and, and, and a huge career, uh, of course. And uh, then after we've heard uh, from each of uh, the practitioners, each of the, uh, of the great thinkers, we'll have a kōrero between, between us. And I'm never quite sure where that's going to go, but it always goes somewhere pretty interesting, especially when you get great uh, thinkers together from different disciplines. Uh, we'll have a, have a look and see how people think and see whether or not it turns out we're all quite similar, or in fact, we're different. We'll find out. Uh, so with me I have uh, a number of wonderful people here. Um, Christian Schult from, uh, from Victoria University. I am going to get them to introduce Hello. themselves. Yeah, actually, why don't you do that? Jump in and introduce yourself, just on there. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Right, right <laughs> just so who you are. You don't have to have uh, your hand on. Turn the No, don't need to. When you, when you put your hand on there, it mutes it. Right. Yeah, <laughs> you're live. Okay. Uh, Christian Schott from uh, Victoria University. I'm a um, staff member in the Tourism Management Unit, which is Tourism Management Research and Teaching, just next door. And um, I'll be talking about virtual reality and climate change and sustainability education. Tēnā koutou katoa. I'm Di Tracy from NIWA, the National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research. I'm based in Wellington, and I'm a deep-sea scientist, so I look in deep-sea ecosystems and, of course, sustainability is at the top of our list of um, research activities. Kia ora. Uh, mauri ora ki te pare. Uh, mauri ora ki tata katoa. Ko hui hui mai nei. Uh, he uri ahau no kaitahu ngā puhi me ngā tikaui. Uh, I'm one of the exhibiting artists and I also wear the curatorial hat for this um, exhibition. Uh, my name's Piri. Um, I'm here to talk about Mahika Kai. So, Mahinga Kai, our uh, customary um, practices, Māori, uh, Māori practices of gathering kai and food, and, um, and also Māori cultural sustainability, how we sustain our culture. Māori ora kia Kia ora uh, ko Maguro Toku Ingoa, uh, no hokianga whakapau karakia hau, tai, oh, okay, it's a bit much, <laughs> tai noa ki tūkare toa, um, i taho tōku pāpa, no uh, Fiji a hau, ni Sarbula Manaka. Uh, my name's Margaret All, I am one of the exhibiting artists here, and here to share uh, with our panel and kata katoa, um, our uh, exhibition, our installation here, Toya's Roma, and mm -hmm. how that connects to this particular kaupapa with the UN. Um, and yeah, Kiko Nei, Kia ora. Kia ora. Tena tata te fare a heuri te neno Ngāti Rehia, Ngāti Ue Pōhatu, Tamau Puko Ki Te Awa Wanganui, Ngāti Tū Whare Toa Ano Hoki. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Gray, and I'm with Maggie. Tēnā tātou. Kia ora. Kia ora, my name is Leilani Kake. I'm of Ngāpuhi, Tainui, and Cook Island descent, and I'm from Ōtara, Auckland. Yes. Uh, kia ora koutou. Thank you very much for those introductions. Uh, we'll, we'll start with you, Pari. Ko au a papa, ko papa ko au. I am the earth mother and the earth mother is me. Ko au te awa, ko te awa ko au. 
I am the river, and the river is me. Ko au te moana, ko te moana ko au. I am the ocean, and the ocean is me. Ko au te rangi, ko te rangi ko au. I am the ear, and the ear is me. This kōrero i rotu i te reo Māori shows one of our, uh, shows a whakaro of interconnectedness. We are all interconnected, and when we think of that relationship with ourselves and our environment, Ngāori te ara ki mua. We can clearly see how we can bring attention to issues of importance such as te paio. And that is the power, one of the powers, of mahi toi, of our arts. I really want to acknowledge in this space the many artists that are bringing attention to the serious issues affecting our environment and to Te Whenua Ukai Po connectedness speaks about Te Taio, our natural environment, our land as a source of sustenance and a sense of belonging. Orada no my heart and my koto. Koina, I'm gonna just put my hat <laughs> and talk to the mahi that I'm here. So um, I am passionate about mahi kakai. When you say mahi kakai, the way that I pronounce that also celebrates, celebrates our mita or kaitahu. Te reo Māori, we have very different mita. So your mita is your dialect, which also connects you to your people and your community. And one of the key ways that kaitahu people, ngaitahu people, people in Te Waipainamu, where my father is from, one of the key ways that we've managed to sustain our culture is through our mahi kakai practices. So mahi kakai is about understanding our environment. Um, I've done a lot of work on tuna, which comes into a whole series of being aware of when is the right time to go eeling. <coughs> to understand our people is to also know that mahi kakai and living by the maramataka, living by the moon, was a way of life for our ancestors. That's how we lived, that's how we survived, and there was a time to work, time to rest, and a time to share kai. If we didn't do that, we wouldn't survive. Um, one of our pepeha that we have is why we care for our environment, care for our reo and our people, is motato a moka uri a muriake nei, for us and our descendants after us. So it's actually the responsibility, and it's, it's a big it's a heavy burden, I don't want to put it all on the rangatahi, but really it's the next generation. And I'm actually going to add a kōrero that happened today, which is kind of split from my notes. But I met a young rangatahi who's 13. He came into the exhibition, he came up to me, no um, ngāti kahungunu, and he said to me, I really like your tuna work. Why? So we then had a kōrero over there, mm -hmm. did a lot of mahi on the bronze. And, um, and then he shared a pepeha from his region today. And he said, I had to write it down, Ko pau kaua te wai u. Te wai u in te reo Māori means the, the breast milk from the mother. But ko pau kaua is the name of their lake. And so that is saying that, that that's their source of sustenance, is that lake. And he shared a kōrero from his kaumātua in Aroha Mai, ko wariwari au tōna ingwa, from that rohe that said, if our lakes and rivers die, we die. And it's as simple as that. No reina ne chaki tato i to tato taiao, to tato finua, hai oranga munga ma materia nga fakatipu. So really, it's about ensuring our the sustainability of our our culture, our ways of living, our practices for the next generation. Um, I'm conscious of the time frames. I'd love to call it all, and I am known to kind of wander, especially when I'm super tired like I was yesterday. <laughs> Um, but really, I just wanted to also seriously acknowledge the UN and especially on the international realm and how much they've supported our exhibition um, and to just really emphasise that um, just the, the support was phenomenal, that they can see that Indigenous voices are often marginalised here and overseas around the world and that I just wanted to thank them for their total with our exhibition in a public forum where we have the video support, and that this is a space that we're able to celebrate our, um, our united connection and care for our environment that we live in, but also a space to open up and create room for our Indigenous people, Indigenous artists to share their voice in a visual way, 
and also in a performance way, and just um, to no mahi hoki kia Rob Thorne i tēnei rangi, thanking him for his performance as well, that he brought his mood and energy into the space today. Um, on that note, I'm going to um, hand it over because I'm really keen to hear from these wahi men <laughs> sitting beside me who have been working, um, <coughs> have been working alongside Simon and with Jill and the Fana and the production team. Because what I find is really exciting as a curator, as a curator hat now is when you work with a team that come and they work in a very strongly, obviously Māori way, we work in a really collective way as a way of supporting and also ensuring that our knowledge is transferred generationally. And that's a key element of mahi kakai, sorry, one more point on mahi kakai. Mahi kakai is when you share those moments of kai, you go out and you harvest the tuna, you, go, you learn how to pāwhara tuna, how to prepare the tuna, um, but you're, it's that intergenerational passing of knowledge that's so exciting and then that brings our young people back to our marae to share kai and to have that connection to place and hopefully want to continue to bring their whānau back to those places and care for our environment. So, koina, uh, te te rākau, kia tauta, kia hara mai, kia kōrero. Kia ora tātou. Um, <coughs> yeah. Initially, uh, when I was contacted to be part of this particular exhibition, um, I had to have a think about how how do these um, these really high level goals, these aspirations for a better way of uh, living, a better future, how can we how can I connect to that? You know. Um, so as an artist, as you do, you sort of just go inwards and you start thinking about, well, what does that look like within yourself? And what does that look like within your own uh, culture, within your own practices and tikanga? And so um, it became quite evident that um, this particular exhibition I wanted to participate because um, a lot of uh, opportunities um, in which is it, they're very rare. So being able to deliver an exhibition in a space where um, we could present um, a way forward um, in terms of our own practices, in terms of rongoa, toi is rongoa. So the kaupapa toi is rongoa is a response to uh, number three of the sustainable goals. Um, and it was quite evident during COVID that um, it, yeah, <laughs> yeah, high water, high water. Um, but when I initially thought of toy as rongoa, I had to kind of think, well, you know, uh, there seems to be a perception, um, and I just want to iterate this, that um, toy, when we talk about toy, it's toy isn't, you know, a bit of print making, a bit of clay, and a bit of carving. When I'm, the kupu toy has a very deep esoteric connection back to a source. A knowledge base. And so when I was thinking about this particular kaupapa, I knew that if we were going to talk about rongo a, um, rongo is a is beyond the physical. We're talking about the sensories. And so it, it became apparent that um, if I was to create this particular mahi, it required some rangaho. So rangaho is research. So this particular project has been a very um, rangaho based project in which I had, had um, reached out to my peers, Leilani Kake um, and, and Elizabeth Gray, uh, to talk about how we could bring in these knowledge systems that uh, connect back to well-being and that potentially a lot of the answers around well-being um, are already embedded in us and understanding how we fit within our tikanga, te taia, um, and what sustainability looks like. So, for those that don't know, rongoa is our uh, healing, healing practices in which we can source materials from, from the land, from, our, um, from nature, from everything around us. And if we understand how to use them, then there's a real opportunity 
to rather wait to, to be in the hospital, mm -hmm. which is a triage at the bottom of the hill, we can do a lot of preventative mahi for ourselves. So rather than waiting, waiting till we're sick, yeah. <laughs> um, realise that you know, if we understand how to use our environment, how we connect to it, more importantly, um, there is an answer to what well-being looks like in terms of the UN goal. So, um, I won't go on too much about it, but in terms of um, this particular offering, um, you know, I do want to, you know, thank the team, pity. I know, I was, I, was, I, was, I was hoping you wouldn't show up with pegs and <laughs> keeping your eyes open, um, because I know how hard and, and how much, how important it was to be able to bring our voices to the platform. So, yeah. Kia ora. Kia ora, Margaret. Could, could you explain for the people that are going to be watching uh, online and some of people that may not have got round the exhibition about your, the work you're talking about? Yeah. What, what does it physically look, physically look like and, and what do the components represent? Okay, sure. I'll, um, and then I'll pass it on to And them. for everyone that's here, it's... T. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to the right over there. So, uh, Toya's Roma is an installation work, uh, multi-sensory, multimedia um, work here. Um, and at, in terms of its presentation, um, it has uh, reo, so when I, I mentioned earlier, romo is the centuries. Um, and then there's these layers around our um, atua, those that take care of each domain, and romo is also connected to our kumara, um, our mara, mara kai, um, and everything's connected, mara mataka and so forth. So, there is, in this particular installation, is the digital reel and um, signs, road signs. Um, so everything is mapped and reorientated around uh, rumo, um, the uh, symbolism around the garden. <laughs> what is that? You read what they sow? And, you know, there's all these, these types of connections and, and um, it's designed in a way to slow people down. Um, so that they become part and parcel of this reflection. But I'll pass you on to Elizabeth, who does the reel, which is the Tom. Can you talk about your part there? Yeah, me. Tēnā tātou, hei tāpari, uh, atu ki ngā kōrero a Māgi. Uh, I, um, yes, I did the audio part to the um, installation, and um, every reel you hear has an effect on uh, you and Rongoa. Uh, so we had a journey from um, the celestial to the terrestrial, the te kauwairunga ki te kauwairaro, uh, and in that, the reo um, is quite um, subtle but uh, purposeful, and every deal that we created uh, has a form of rongoa or has a pūrāko associated to the reo. Too much? Can we understand? understand? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> English isn't too great. Every, 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 every instrument, reo, has a purpose for a particular part of healing process. Aye. Yeah. Aye. And so um, after rangahau, after the research around rongoa and toi hei rongoa, uh, we came up with a narrative and it was then, then uh, that we could create uh, this beautiful piece of um, toi hei rongo. Uh, and in that, um, it was really easy to um, compose the reel or the track. So it's a six minute um, track on a loop and uh, the journey, I think, a whakatina na a, a leilani um, i ana visual artwork. My, um, my heart is beating out of my chest, to be honest. <clears throat> I'd like to thank um, the panellists as well. I'm really honoured to be a part of this exhibition. <clears throat> uh, I do the uh, video work, the digital video, um, and it really is a, a manifestation of the vibration and frequency of the, connect, the connectedness of everyone. And I could go into more about the artwork, but I'm, I'm kind of more um, interested in the, in the fact that I am Māori, I am Cook Island, but I also am a human being, a child of the planet. 
and at the very bottom of, or at the very top of everything, we can see this year the fires, the locusts, the swarms, um, and with COVID, I think it's kind of uh, made us recognise where we are in the pecking order. We are not the, the top. We can go to space, we can create all these, you know, medicines, but it takes a, a, a germ to actually make us recognise where we are. And I think Toy is is also about warning. We are seeing warning signs. And I just went to McDonald's and I was <laughs> sipping on a, on a straw going, this is a paper straw. Well, look how long it took for us to, to change from plastic to, to paper. And then I was thinking about the oceans of plastic. And I'm not a great um, gatherer of kaimoana, I'll be honest. Um, but I do love the sea and something needs to change. And I think, I wish I could be a scientist. I wish I could come up with great ideas to change the world. But I think our, our role as artists is to um, try and articulate the aims of possibly science, um, education, to try and give voices and, and other views for other people to see. Ah, oh, okay. Um, I could talk more, but actually all of our works here are discussing the same ideas. We're all asking and calling for change and calling for um, a new consciousness, a new way of thinking. Because everyone goes, I can't wait to get back to normal. We need a new normal. Kia ora. Kia ora. Maybe the new normal is our old normal, right? Kia ora, Leilani. And that was a wonderful segue, actually. Wake up, computer. Uh, to our next speaker who's died, Tracy, um, who is going to talk about uh, part of the ecology and to go under the water, assuming this computer wakes up. Here it is. Kia ora koutou. And I'll just start your slideshow. Okay. Um, first of all, I have a small mihi. A hakoa, he iti, he taonga, tongo. Tēnā koutou kata. Katoa, ko Taranaki toko maonga. Kia o mahi ai. Kiti hitori o parihaka. Kireira. Kote fanganui atara. Toko kainga noho. Hei putao. Aho mona ika. So I'm studying fish. Um, mina ka o, which is corals. Uh, ki ki taihoro nukarangi at niwa. Ko dai Tracy toko ingoa, no reira tēnā tātou katoa. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia I'm sorry to be such a scientist and give a um, PowerPoint presentation, <laughs> but uh, mainly it's just lots of really beautiful images of the deep sea corals that I study. Um, and, of course, the interconnectedness of the ocean um, is one of its defining characteristics. <clears throat> So with my focus today on deep sea corals, um, a group of animals that provide habitat and structure in the deep sea, the ocean features very strongly. Um, I'd like to weave the coral research into my discussion and into the con connectedness um, theme. So um, this ability of species and processes to move and flow from place to place is called ecological connectivity and it's increasingly recognised um, as a key aspect of successful marine conservation. And um, I'd also like to be, show you on the way how beautiful these corals are. Um, there is also that comment about well-being, and of course that's what we're trying to do with a lot of our deep-sea ecosystems. Um, we need to protect them and, and leverage this connectivity um, conservation to um, protect, have marine protected areas. And certainly the UN has a key role in this, and it's great to be part of the 75th anniversary of the UN. But also um, the UN has these conventions, um, like UNCLOS, the Convention for the Law of the Sea, uh, the UNGA, the United Nations General Assembly, um, and there's conventions for biological diversity. And then 
Closer to home, we've got all these regional fisheries management organizations in the high seas, like SPRIFMO, South Pacific Regional Fisheries Management Organizations, and also in Antarctic and Antarctic waters, where you also find a lot of corals. So um, that's it for my intro, and I just wanted to um, introduce you to the corals and also to the left, some of the deep sea sponges that provide habitat and ecosystems in the deep sea. And these are the, uh, just the few words I have, which is about the relevance of, of our marine conservation principles, that we want to sustain what we've got um, and understand the science. And we certainly are engaging with tangata whenua through Vision Mataranga and all our science and the New Zealand public speaking at these types of fora and speaking to environmentalist scientists and managers. So the UN is one of the key international drivers. And there's a lot of demands for fishing and mining and mineral exploration that kind of is a, 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 in, in conflict with um, trying to protect areas as well. So we try and manage all that um, information. So um, we've, we've got this... Um, so I'll be talking about corals, and, and it's a huge group. There's six classes and thousands of species, and they include jellyfish, and some of the artwork here with a macrame wall hanging in the next room reminds me of jellyfish, and um, anemones, and, and then, of course, the true corals, the, the um, hard, protected black corals, uh, stylasterid hydrocorals, um, and sea fan corals are what I study. It's a huge group. We've got this huge marine realm, a huge e economic zone that um, supports this rich biodiversity. It's the fifth largest exclusive economic zone in the world, so it's, it's massive, and we try to manage that and find out what's there. And, and it, I'm talking about the corals in the deep, but we do have the corals in the um, shallow waters. In the Kermadec, Rangitahua region, we have a lot of shallow water corals. And we've, we rarely go to that region, which is great. It's a protected area, and it, we're hoping it will be close to um, not just the bottom trawling, but to other fishing um, in that area. But um, it supports a lot of these corals that are connected to the corals in the Pacific region, in Fiji, but also um, in, to Australia. Lots of the same species you get in the in the Kermadec Rangitahua region are also found throughout the Pacific. So they're super amazing corals, but I don't work on them. I um, sit in a dark room when I'm on the research vessel Tangaroa and look at videos. So our lens to look at our species is through the um, cameras and videos that we have. Um, so it's, it's pretty out of sight, out of mind, um, the kind of uh, research that we do. Um, and there's many, many um, deep sea corals. So I'll just flick through a whole lot of images and show you these species. Um, the black corals, they're found in Fiordland. Of course, you probably all know about that, but they're also found all the way through our zone. And they have many forms. They're kind of tree-like. Um, they're very beautiful and artistic. And they um, are bushy, and they host other animals. So, you know, they provide refuge and shelter for fish, but they also have, have in other invertebrates living on them. Um, this is the group that I'm mainly talking about today, the Scaritinian stony coral species. And I'm, I'm, I'm copying Boy's words that he gave us yesterday, Bay's words that um, he gave us yesterday, sorry, Bay, um, about I'm trying to speak for this species, um, just as you um, said yesterday how uh, uh, other um, organisms need a voice if we can't hear their voice in the deep sea. I'm sure they've got a voice, eh, hey, Margaret? <laughs> yeah, so these, are the, these form frameworks, so they're like reef corals, and they drape themselves over all the seamounts that you find in the deep sea. And there's just some, a few more examples of them, and I'm holding one of the cup corals in my hand, um, but, and they just attach um, to hard rock and other corals, but the other forms um, create these big reef systems. And there's just a few banded bellowfish and echinoderms swimming above these ones. Um, and, of course, some of them are within diving depths in the north, like these gorgeous sea fans. Um, but most of them are in over 800 metres. 
800 to, down to 3,000. They're slow growing, they're long lived, and this is one of my favorites, the sea fan. It's the coldy of the deep, we call it. Um, it's hundreds of years old. It's kind of overarching in the current in this image, and you can see this little fish tucked amongst the polyps. And each polyp is an animal. And um, this is another group that's quite colorful. And this is dilasterid hydrocorals that we call the lace corals, and they're really delicate. So um, I've talked quite a lot about Otaranaki, where I was born, but also about sea mounts. So under the ocean, there are mountains the size of Taranaki, and um, those are the features that we study. They're not all that big. Some of them are only the size of Mount Victoria that you can run up in the morning on a beautiful Wellington day. So they're just like hills and knolls, but there are also seamounts that are really massive. And Margaret's exhibit really reminded me of underwater seamounts, you know, these little pointed, pointy features of what I thought was scoria rock, but I think it's sediment, it's, it's soil. Um, and the corals like to attach to these features because they can get lots of food that kind of zips by and they can feed on that. So um, this Le Havre seamount in, in um, the Kermadex is um, massive, as big as Taranaki. And it's a caldera, and then it's kind of erupted. Um, and this, this is just my... Um, connection here about the ecological connectivity. So we're all connected and ecologically we're also connected. And um, Simon just asked me to um, quickly talk about stresses. So we've talked about plastics, we've talked about um, trawling in, in mining and mineral exploration. Sedimentation is another impact on corals. If you disturb the bottom of the ocean, everything's going to get stirred up. Um, but also climate change, and we heard a lot yesterday about climate change. So as the ocean temperatures increase and as the um, oceans become more acidic and the pH changes, um, we're worried about these calcium carbonate structures, including corals. So, so it's um, temperature and ocean acidification. Um, and this is just a really quick slide to show what ocean acidification is. Um, um, James Renwick spoke about it a bit yesterday. So the, bike, you know, the CO2 increases in the atmosphere and then it gets, goes down into the ocean and gets absorbed into the ocean and just changes the whole ocean chemistry. And at the moment we're not seeing impacts from this, but we're worried that a lot of these animals' um, skeletons will dissolve. So um, this is why we need to be so aware about what we can do um, environmentally. Um, and here's our experiment that we did, um, just two more slides, um, which uh, we went out on Tangaro and collected these corals, um, the sclerotinian stony coral, kept them in an aquarium in the dark and cold water to mimic the environment that they're from. And um, the results showed that they could actually still grow um, um, and they were pretty robust, but they lost a lot of the pink tissue that you see on, that gives the skeleton its strength. It's called senenchyme. And so um, this tissue loss, loss has really long-term implications. Um, so, yes, um, kia ora tato. Thank you very much um, for indulging me in the slideshow. And I hope you enjoyed the, uh, the beauty of the, the corals. Okay. You come up. He's coming up. Come on, Christian. Come and join me. We'll, we'll get your slideshow going. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dai, for taking us deep, deep into the ocean. Um, that was a real privilege. You've never been down that far yourself, I take it? No, we can't afford submersibles in New Zealand. Oh, so, so it's possible. <laughs> Actually, you could have done it yourself, couldn't you? I could have. Kia ora. Um, tēnā koutou, uh, no Christian Chataho, ko Taputaranga ho, um, tēnā koutou katoa, although I think that was in reverse. <laughs> so I'm, uh, I hail from Taputaranga here, which is Island Bay, just on the south coast, um, although I'm originally from Germany. So I'm a, I'm a visitor here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and I was asked to talk about how I approach both the SDGs, but I suppose also the, the broader theme of the exhibition, where I 
Um, I, I'm not an indigenous person. I'm very in, interested in indigenous perspectives. And being in tourism, being a tourism researcher and tourism teacher, indigenous people are everywhere. And often indigenous people are the very product that tourists come to see. So it's about understanding and acknowledging different perspectives on life, different worldviews, and understanding that um, what we might bring with us as expectations might not be the same as the people that we come to visit. So I um, want to start though by broadening it out to look at the, at the mission of the SDGs. Um, the United Nations Development Programme stated that with the adoption of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development back in 2015, 193 United Nations member states, which is all, pledged to ensure that no one will be left behind. And this is the thing that I'm really interested in. So the SDGs were developed to leave no one behind, meaning this is no longer just about developing countries, it's about all nations of the world because we all have a stake in this. But I think there's also a broader message here that as educators, this means we also have to take responsibility not to, to leave any of our, of our learners behind. And I don't now mean this in terms of necessarily performance that we make them all A students. But what I really mean is that the, the issue here is too big and too pressing to leave people behind. So I've been looking at how we can innovate how we teach. And the best way to tell this story is through a very glossy video. I have to apologize. Um, we just recorded it on Thursday. It's for an awards competition, so it's a bit like Victoria this, Victoria that. But unfortunately, that can't be helped in this case. But it gives you a very quick two-minute overview of why I'm doing this, why I think this is important, and a little bit on some of the impact, and then I'll tell a little bit more of a story of how this came about. It is using technology because the technology is there, we should use it for a greater good. The world is changing dramatically around us, and humans are the cause of much of this. Oh, sorry, that was too much. Mismanagement, we have climate change. But at the same time, although this topic is so crucial and is supported by the Sustainable Development Goals, and the UN who say we should leave no one behind in our journey towards a more sustainable future. In our education, I think we are leaving people behind. So despite this topic being so crucial, we still often teach it in a very traditional way in terms of passive learning. And what this means is that we, we lose our students often because they become disengaged. If we leave people behind, they cannot be champions for a more sustainable future. Experiential education is what we need to adopt. Virtual reality provides that beautiful opportunity for us to really engage our learners, to help them understand the nuances and complexities of scenarios of sustainability and climate change by taking them into the space where these things really matter without having to travel. And to learn from those people there about what their concerns are about sustainability. So we need to make more use of virtual reality for sustainability education because the students we have today are the leaders of the future and they will take us to that future if they're truly deeply educated on what is happening around us. This project has been very well received. We have now got two learning tools, one in Peru, one in Fiji that are both being used widely. And this has had a big impact because 2,500 students around the world have now used this in Canada, in Vanuatu, as well as in New Zealand. And we hope that this will continue to make a great contribution towards that sustainable future that we all want. So I'm not actually selling anything. It's really just telling the story. And we were given a two minute uh, time frame, which is very, very tight. Um, what I what was particularly um, sort of moving for me is that I asked uh, my current master student to come along, who's from Papua New Guinea, who is the student that you saw in the video, to, to sort of try it. And after she tried it, initially she was quite sort of soft-spoken about what she thought, but when she took the headset off and came back to New Zealand, she said it really, it was quite powerful for her because at the moment with COVID-19 she can't go home. She can't go back to her village, which is close to the, uh, 
to the water. Um, her father's village is close to an island. So this actually felt very familiar to her, and it felt, I wouldn't say authentic, but it really took her back there, and it made her quite emotional about the, this disconnection that she's currently experiencing. And I suppose if, if that kind of emotions can be evoked in someone who is from the Pacific, then this has got some, uh, some really interesting aspects to offer. And the way that we develop this is that we base it on a, on a real place. So the first one that we developed back, back in 2011, in fact, up in the northern reaches of uh, Fiji, the Yasawa Islands, a place called Yasawa Irara, we, we went to the island and we started by documenting everything and then started by developing um, in gaming software a way of visiting that environment. It will be somewhat contrived, but unless you go into gaming software, you basically put people on a bit of a train and then you show them images of this and this and this. But again, you're making it quite passive. You're taking that active learning process out of it. With this, students can go anywhere they want to go. And some places might not be very interesting, a bit like a real island. You walk into a piece of bush, there's nothing to see, you turn around and go somewhere else. And with virtual reality in the headsets that we now have, we can actually take people really in an immersive way to those places. When you wear the, the headset, you truly lose sense of, of where you are. We have the auditory immersion because you hear the waves washing over by the beach, which is just on the left. And um, we have been able to refine this over time. And what, of course, matters the most is not really the island. The island is beautiful. I would quite happily sit there and just look at the water for an hour. But it's the people. And the people tell the story of what's happening. They tell the story about sustainability, how interconnected sustainability is, because that's what the students often struggle with. They get the whole thing, sustainability is important. But how do you really change things when you have to consider that environmental um, impacts have consequences on social and cultural impacts? Economic impacts are intertwined with environmental and social and cultural impacts. So there's always that interconnectedness. But if you take it away from a living environment such as this, it's very difficult to deeply understand. So these learning tools are really based on bringing the people into those experiences. So these are two young women in that Fijian village talking about the future that they want. What are their aspirations? Which can be different to the elders who sit in a similar circle and talk, but they have slightly different visions because they're generational differences. And all throughout the, the island, we have videos of these different community members. And it's about acknowledging diversity, but it's also about acknowledging the traditional customs that you have to go through. And I say vous say vous in the way that you would when you enter other indigenous land with either porphyry or something else. And where I think this really brings in the SDGs is it is about life underwater because that's what these islands live off. Without fishing, they couldn't sustain their livelihood out there. But of course, all of that ultimately translates into no poverty. It translates into quality education for our students, as well as telling the story of how tourism can also bring benefits, if well managed, to these islands and give their children quality education. It's about sustainable communities by acknowledging that they are the key decision makers, they are the landowners, they are the rights holders, they need to dictate the journey. You need to stop because what you have is it take, can take from 35 to 80, what I've heard in my research, <laughs> ahakoa well, working with whānau, is that it can take from 35 to 80 years before a tuna is ready to migrate. And the most amazing thing with our, well, I find really amazing about our long term tuna is that they will migrate and they go up the coast up to Tonga, which is where we've heard that they, release, that they spawn and release the eggs, and then they drift back on our currents all down the coastline, and they come back to Aotearoa. So the long fin tuna is endemic to only this, this, um, these islands, Apotu. And, and if you think about what happens to our waterways in that time period, 35, 80 years, what's happening, you know, how many dams have been built, you know, how much farming is happening around those spaces that are impacting the health of our waters. So, because even though we, in some of our rivers, we have, you know, we have white, but what is that quality? 
the water. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, you, know, you just have to look at the news and see how much um, pollution is impacting in our local rivers, even within our region. And um, yeah, that's just to share some of the knowledge that I've gained. But I think it's really, I think it's a really precious opportunity if you can have that chance to go out with Farno who live and work on the land. And uh, another copy that we have in Te Reo Māori is um, Kiri Tuna or Kiri Hau. So somebody who's Kiri Tuna is somebody who's got thick skin and is tenacious like a tuna. And so I think there's, there's beautiful connections within our language and when you understand Te Reo Māori you'll see there's so many multiple readings and multiple layers within our language and our view. And um, with 50 names yep. for dinner, there's not 50 species, is there? No. And, and <coughs> does each name reveal a different aspect of a dinner yeah. or a, yeah. a different situation? Or? Um, so, uh, what I have come across is like they kind of, there's some of them reference the, um, the, the texture of the skin, the colour of the skin, um, the size of the tuna. So, yeah, it, it's, I think it shows an insight, and that's the beauty of Te Reo Māori. When you start to learn Te Reo, you see an insight to how our tūpuna saw the world and their worldview. You know, they're kind of like they're strongly observing everything around them. And I think it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing mm -hmm. Te Reo Māori. And, and, and there are other, um, just to go back to the meeting this Rangatahi today, and I, we were talking, we had a conversation about Tuna and we was like excited that we're still able to go back to this Roto um, Pokoa with his whānau. Um, but yeah, just you could sense that he understood the beauty, you know, like he just said they're beautiful in our Tuna. And so when you say, when, um, and if, I, if I talk about this, we have a, this is Hau, so Hau is a kaitangu, Hau is a, Hau is a kaitangu word for Tuna. Um, so we say kiri hao, and uh, they get into really interesting conversations with whānau, but mahi, mahi kakai people, and they go, oh, that doesn't look like the tuna. I haven't seen a tuna like that. Or they go, oh, you only see them like that when they're running away or they're about to get gagged. So, <laughs> so, um, my, when I'm creating art, it's really about expressing the modi and how I feel it or see it. It's not necessarily a literal photographic representation. I'm looking for the modi and I'm looking for how to express that with um, Kuringa, you know, with my hands, talking for cloud, my thoughts, talking waiva, my spirit, and talking you know, So that's um, my essence. I'm trying to imbue that and bring bring that attention back to the tuna and how precious they are. You know, they are um, considered. Um, I can't remember, sorry, the doc term for it, but I, I consider them a threatened species. Yeah. I think there's another term, um, but they are. Yeah, they're. The environment is fragile. It's an autonomous that tuna came up with. And is the environment fragile down in the deeps? Uh, yes, I've, I've mentioned how slow growing and long lived corals are, and so are tuna. Yes. Yeah. And they're very slow growing. They lived to have over 100 years, those huge mm. um, And corals, of course, are, are very life in the slow lane in the deep sea, that would be very slow um, And I've talked about the threats from fishing and mining and mineral exploration, and that the well-being um, that we are probably most concerned about would be climate change, you know, 